and welcome to our webinar called What Financial Institutions Need to Know About Cryptocurrencies. Uh, my name is Anu Sood and I'm the Director of Marketing at Alessa and I'll be your moderator today. Now today's presenters uh, and sponsors are Daniel Peake from Caseware RCM who are the makers of Alessa, Greg Pinn from iComply and the team at Refinitiv. So with that, I'd like to now introduce our speakers. Now, Daniel Peake is, the, is a board advisor at Caseware, and he has expertise in risk intelligence, online risk, cybercrime, as well as compliance with the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act and the Common Reporting Standards for International Tax Reporting. He's also the former CEO for WorldCheck, now Refinitiv, and, had, and led the company to a successful sale to Thomson Reuters. Greg Pinn is Head of Product Strategy at iComply Investor Services and has over a decade of experience leading global best practices in AML and Know Your Customer industry. He specializes in building industry-leading products to help financial institutions, both traditional and crypto, scale operations, reduce risk, and ensure compliance with global regulations. Uh, at iComply, Greg works with industry-leading virtual asset, virtual asset service providers to develop, build, and maintain best-in-class best compliance programs. So with that, I'd like to, I'm handing over to Dan Peake. Thank you, Anu, and uh, thank you for, uh, for getting us started. Just so we get the voices clear, I'm Dan Peake, and uh, we're here today with uh, Greg. Greg, thank you for doing this. I can't think of a better person to do this, and it's nice to be doing this with you. So let's just do a quick review of what we'll cover for the day, and then I'll turn this over to Greg. Uh, we will we'll spend a few minutes defining the lay of the land of, uh, of cryptocurrency, a uh, what is it and what business, uh, uh, point one, and then point two being reviewing the regulatory requirements you face, and our emphasis will be on point three, the differences between the challenges and risks you face with fiat versus uh, crypto relationships and, and transactions. And then lastly, point four, we'll look at the specific challenges for compliance with client onboarding, transaction monitoring, regulatory reporting around cryptocurrencies. So, so Greg, where, uh, where better to start? Uh, a definition of cryptocurrency and a brief history to get us all on the same page? Yeah, definitely. Uh, thank you so much, Dan. Uh, again, this is, this is Greg Penn um, with iComply Investor Services. Dan and I worked together for many, many years uh, at WorldCheck, and so it's it's great to be to be back with you again, Dan. So to set set the lay of the land uh, for everyone, I know we all come to this with with sort of different preconceptions as to what is cryptocurrency, what what is a distributed ledger, what is Bitcoin, what is blockchain. So to simplify all of that, I'd like to sort of level set with what is a, a clear definition of cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency is a math-based, decentralized, convertible virtual currency that's protected by cryptography. Let's break that down a little bit. I know that's a lot of sort of um, very specific, industry specific words. What decentralized mean, means that there is no single administering authority. Um, in, in the case of, of finance, that would, in the case of traditional currency, that would be a central bank. Um, one of the things, interestingly enough, uh, as, we, as we look at, at cryptocurrencies like Libra, is that Libra doesn't meet this first requirement. Libra is not, to, as, of, as of its initial white paper, Libra is a centralized. Uh, it's centralized to the, to Libri, to the Libra Association. It, it, sorry, it has a central administrating authority. And that puts into question, really, uh, what is it truly a cryptocurrency? Convertible means it can be exchanged. It can be exchanged either with other cryptocurrencies or it can be ex exchanged back and forth with traditional, or what we call fiat currency. Within the cryptocurrency space, you'll often hear the term fiat. And fiat has just become the catch-all term for standard, traditional, government-issued currency, the dollar, the euro, um, the yen, the yuan, the peso, et cetera, et cetera. A virtual currency means that this is a digital representation of, of money. Um, and that means it's a, that it functions either as a medium of exchange, an, a unit of account, or a store of value. A virtual currency can mean a lot of different things that are not cryptocurrency. Uh, your, your credit card miles, in a certain way, are a virtual currency. They hold a value. They store a value for you. Um, the same thing with a prepaid card. 
uh, or gift card. This can be considered a virtual currency. And finally, cryptography. Cryptography is very sophisticated math that allows for the securing of cryptocurrency without requiring uh, a governing body to ensure the full faith and credit of the cryptocurrency. So where uh, the dollar is, is tied to the full faith and credit of, of the United States, in the case of cryptocurrency, the value of the cryptocurrency or the, the stability of the currency is tied into, its, into the math. The fact that the math is sophisticated enough uh, and can be proven to be sophisticated enough that it secures the currency. It restricts the ability for uh, bad actors to create or destroy currency uh, and ensures that the flow of transactions is done in a secure way. Uh, and that's, that's what the basis of a blockchain or distributed ledger is. So now that we've got a, a pretty good uh, round out, rounded out definition of a cryptocurrency, it's good to look at the history of sort of how did we get to where we are today? Um, you know, I think for some people, cryptocurrency feels like it's been around forever. Uh, for other people, this is a new crazy thing that they you know, never thought they'd have to deal with. The very first um, sort of the, the, the birth of cryptocurrency is usually called out to Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper, which was released uh, at the end of October in 2008. Uh, Satoshi Nakamoto is a, it's, it's a nom de plume, it's a pseudonym. Um, there's a lot of discussion within the community as to who Satoshi is or was whether it was one person or multiple people. But the reality is that as an industry, nobody really knows who Satoshi is. Um, Satoshi did not completely invent the concept of cryptocurrency or distributed ledger, but really was the first one to bring these ideas together and build some code and a system around them to release Bitcoin. Uh, so Satoshi created Bitcoin and really, while there had been previous versions of what could have been sort of nascent cryptocurrencies, we call the birth of cryptocurrency really the releasing of the white paper. The next year, 2009, the first Bitcoin block was mined. Uh, and mining is a, is a complicated concept and, and not one really for this, uh, for the focus of this webinar. But briefly what mining is, is the ability to certify transactions uh, on the blockchain. And so the first uh, blocks of, uh, the first blocks of, of Bitcoin were released the year after the white paper came out. In 2010, the first exchange, BitcoinMarket.com opened. BitcoinMarket.com is closed many years ago, it no longer exists, but this was the first way that people could buy, sell, and trade Bitcoin. So you could exchange for fiat uh, and you could move Bitcoin around easily between individuals. One of the difficult things with creating a system like Bitcoin is that you, once you've created the the actual currency, the software that runs the currency, you also need all of these ancillary tools, what we now call value added service, uh, vir virtual asset service providers, excuse me, uh, to facilitate a lot of these things. And so bitcoinmarket.com was really the first of those. In 2011, we saw the very first organization start accepting Bitcoin. A lot of these were very privacy focused organizations, organizations like WikiLeaks started accepting Bitcoin in 2011. And then in 2013, FinCEN released their first guidance on virtual currencies. And this first guidance was very much focused on what is and is not a virtual currency and who potentially may or may not be covered by uh, existing bank secrecy acts, AML, and KYC uh, regulations. Uh, FinCEN in 2013, took it was a very high level review. So this was not a, a deep discussion, but really made the clear di distinction that it, between a user and a facilitator. A user being someone who buys cryptocurrency for themselves or trades it in the same way that you would money versus a facilitator on exchange that is in the business of, of facilitating user activity. And that was the key distinction that FinCEN made in 2013, is that just, in, just the same as with um, traditional currencies, the BSA and similar AML and KYC regulations, and this is true globally, not just in the US, but those things apply to businesses and governments. Uh, they do not uh, apply to end users typically. And FinCEN basically came out and made that statement in 2013. In 2014, FinTrack, the Canadian regulator, uh, announced its intentions to address virtual currency as well. And so this was FinTrack, um, uh, and, and I'm not gonna obviously go through 
uh, all regulators in, in all countries. Um, but this was FinTrack's first announcement saying, okay, this is something we, we, we know is going to just stay around and we need to start getting on top of, of these regulations. 2014 also brought us the first uh, or the first significant hack of a cryptocurrency exchange. This was Mt. Gox. Uh, Mt. Gox was shut down after it lost 850,000 Bitcoin, which in today's market would be about $8 billion. Obviously, in 2014, it was worth far, far less. But because of the loss of this Bitcoin, it shut down Mt. Gox's business and put them in a significant, significant legal troubles. In 2015, Ethereum was released. And so while I'm sure all of you are, are at least have heard of Bitcoin, uh, I'm guessing not all of you have heard of Ethereum. Ethereum is sort of the second most common and, and second highest market share cryptocurrency. Uh, it's important to note there are hundreds or uh, depending on how you count, hundreds or even thousands of different cryptocurrencies. Uh, the top 10 or 20 are the ones that we really focus on for these conversations. Uh, but the big difference between Ethereum and Bitcoin is that Ethereum said that there's a lot more you can do with this technology than simply exchange value than simply being a currency. And that there's great, there's great potential for a Bitcoin as a currency, but Ethereum said you can do more. And so what Ethereum created was the concept of a smart contract. Now, a smart contract is a very poorly named uh, thing, but what, because it's neither a contract nor is it very smart, uh, but what it allows you to do is um, create very small programs, which are traditionally called dApps. And those dApps can serve a variety of purposes. But one of the things that they can do is that th those dApps can represent in, in Ethereum, in this public blockchain, it, they can represent physical assets in the same way that a stock certificate or an ownership certificate can. So this opened the door for things like being able to sell uh, it's concert tickets through Ethereum. There are vendors that do that, um, where your ticket is is a is a DAP, is a, a specific contract that exists on the Ethereum blockchain. And because the blockchain is public, because it's immutable, it can't be changed by uh, by any bad actor. Uh, there's a single source of truth for who owns all of those tickets. Um, and this is where we initially saw the the huge expansion of of ICOs, initial coin offerings, STOs security token offerings, and other tokenized assets. Uh, and the, the list of things that can be tokenized go well beyond securities. Uh, we've seen examples of people tokenizing real estate assets, tokenizing um, um, alcohol assets. So um, this might be barrels of wine or barrels of whiskey that can be tokenized. Anything that could be represented in an ownership certificate now can be represented on a public blockchain. Uh, the blockchain, however, gives a, a, a full view of the full history of, of the ownership, as well as being a single source of truth. Things aren't left up to a sheet of paper that someone owns or something living on someone's computer. Because the blockchain is shared across all the nodes and everyone has the same copy, this provides a huge level of security. In 2016, um, 100 and almost 120,000 Bitcoin was stolen from Bitfinex, where it's selling them $13 million today. And I'm sure as when, when these hacks and these losses happen, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you see these things on the news and it, it causes some challenges for the community. Um, because while the purpose of our conversation here is to talk about AML and KYC issues, uh, data security issues are, are another huge challenge of the cryptocurrency industry. In 2017, Bitcoin Cash uh, hard fork from Bitcoin. Uh, I bring this up because of the term, I think it's important to introduce you to the term of a hard fork. Basically, what a fork means is a new version. And you can have forks where uh, everyone goes along and we, you just upgrade the entire network. Or in the case of Bitcoin Cash, where Bitcoin still exists, and now you have a new cryptocurrency called Bitcoin Cash. In 2018, the G20 committed to implementing FATF standards for crypto assets. Uh, we saw the hack of Quadriga CX, or not really a hack. Uh, Quadri the CEO of Quadriga CX, which was a large Canadian exchange, uh, died under mysterious circumstances in India, um, and he had the only uh, all, he had access to the private keys, um, which caused a loss of 145 million dollars. And what's really been exciting is what's happened in the last year or so with regulators. Um, so we've seen uh, both FinCEN and FATF releasing new guidance uh, as it concerns. Um, AML and KYC regulations. This has been the case 
globally as well. Um, so not only are we seeing from FinCEN and FATF a, uh, uh, a increase in, in regulation and regulatory uh, guidance, but we're seeing the FATF member states and countries globally looking at this as well. One of the things to, to, to be conscious of when you're, when you're dealing with cryptocurrency from a regulatory perspective is that the laws for, for cryptocurrency are changing day to day and country to country. There are countries like China that have, um, have, have basically outlawed cryptocurrency, although there are still many mining pools that run in China. Um, India has gone back and forth with how they want to deal with it, whether it should be illegal or not. South Korea has gone back and forth. Um, in Canada, uh, cryptocurrency is legal, but it's it's difficult or impossible to get banked in Canada, or at least it's it's been historically been quite difficult. Uh, that's actually you know one of the things that that uh, my organization I comply uh, helps our clients do is is get banked these jurisdictions. Um, the next thing I sort of want to want to talk to, and then I'll I'll hand it back to Dan, uh, is looking at the cryptocurrency landscape. And so a lot of people think that Bitcoin and cryptocurrency are the same thing, and they're not. Uh, Bitcoin is a type of currency, in the same way that a dollar is a type of traditional currency. Uh, Bitcoin has a significant percentage of the market. Um, it usually ranges from about 50 to 65 percent of the mar total market capitalization is Bitcoin. But Bitcoin represents one of many different potential uh, use cases for, uh, for cryptocurrency. And so we'll start with those. Uh, in the center of the circle is Bitcoin. Uh, and then Bitcoin represents sort of the, the, the origination of all of these things. But Bitcoin is also a, tr a conventional cryptocurrency. Uh, this is where you see currencies like Litecoin, Dogecoin, Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin Gold. These are those cryptocurrencies that's primary or sole purpose is to function as a currency and to exchange value. Not all cryptocurrencies are like that. Uh, you have information network cryptocurrencies, um, NEM, VeChain, IOTA. Uh, these are currencies that, um, while have a currency, the focus of these blockchains are to hold and transmit information. Uh, and where, where this is being used significantly is in the very, very high value um, luxury goods um, industry. And so being able to track luxury goods through their entire supply chain and their entire ownership history can be done through these networks and is a way for people that are buying very, very high end luxury goods to ensure that the goods that they're buying are real and that they can verify the providence of those goods. Uh, privacy coins, um, the big ones here are Zchain, Monero and Dash. These are coins that pose a significant regulatory um, challenge. Uh, as because they're they're focused on anonymity, on making the the originator and uh, destination of the originator and the the uh, beneficiary of a transaction uh, anonymous or pseudo anonymous, as well as the actual transactions themselves. And so they use very very complex um, algorithms to to be able to obfuscate those the transaction. These are currencies that are very very focused on privacy. Uh, these privacy coins are at odds with global AML KYC standards, and it's very difficult, if, 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 if possible at all, for to deal in these currencies while being compliant with, uh, with AML and KYC regulations. So much so that a major exchange in Korea announced this week that they will stop listing privacy coins because of AML and KYC concerns. Then you have settlement networks, um, Stellar, which called Stellar Lumens, RippleNet, uh, are the two major ones here. We also see a number of traditional financial institutions. Uh, this week it was announced that uh, JP Morgan and Deutsche Bank uh, are working together to create their own settlement network, working with their correspondent banks. And so we see a lot of these private um, cryptocurrency networks, which are used to settle what, what is historically done with SWIFT, uh, to settle those transactions through a, crypto, a private cryptocurrency network. And what a private network means is that not anyone can register and can be on the network, only those members that are approved. We then have smart contract networks. We talked about Ethereum. There are a lot of, of other similar ones, uh, EOS and Cardano being the ones that people refer to the most. And finally, stable coins. Uh, stable coins are those, uh, those uh, cryptocurrencies 
that are attached to something physical in the real world. The majority of stable coins that exist today are attached to a, to a fiat currency, uh, most often the dollar. So uh, Tether, uh, USD coin, true USD are all tied to the dollar. Um, but Libra, interestingly enough, is really a stable coin. Uh, Facebook's Libra is not tied to the dollar, but it's tied to a basket of goods. And so because it's tied to something in the physical realm, uh, we, we call that a stable coin as well. It's not, it's not, the exchange value isn't supply and demand the way that, uh, say, Bitcoin is. It's much more tied to the value of, of, that, uh, of that, that base thing. Dan? Yep. Uh, so thank you. I mean, so you've got a uh, definition. What is cryptocurrency? You've got a history of how we got here. Um, it's interesting that it took the regulatory agencies as long as it has to wade in with a, uh, with a detailed definition of what's expected for compliance. Um, and we'll come back and spend more time on that, of course. Uh, you mapped out what the current cryptocurrency landscape is here. And it's interesting because two of the bigger drivers of media stories right now are two that you acknowledged but don't appear on the map, which would be Facebook, Libra, and the, and the JP Morgan uh, standard for, uh, for uh, payment, clearing, clearing payments that actually uh, now, as you pointed out, Deutsche Bank has signed on to, um, doesn't even, you know, those aren't real services as, as yet. Um, and arguably in the case of some may not be. But let's take this a step further then because all cryptocurrencies, as you've already pointed out, tend to have fairly specific roles. So how do you start to map it in a way that makes sense to compliance persons attending the seminar today? So what do you, what do you have next to better organize that for us? So I think that there's two ways we, we, we need to look at this. One, I think we'll, we'll look, uh, I think you made a good point. Uh, my, my map here goes to 2018. Um, we'll need a 2019, 2020, 2021 map. I think we'll we'll definitely con continue to see um, new cryptocurrencies enter the space, and frankly, see some die off. Lack of interest, lack of investment. Um, I think that's that's a natural part of any new technology. Libra as well. I mean, Libra has not come out and has really hit significant regulatory pressure. Uh, this week, uh, some member states in the EU uh, have come out and said that Libra should never be allowed to exist. That Facebook should not be allowed to be in the in the yeah, finance industry. And so, France, France led the charge on that. That was a pretty interesting slap to uh, to those uh, attention yeah, so, to the market. <laughs> yeah, so it's, you know, where Libra goes, we you know, that'll be a very exciting thing to watch. Uh, but as we look forward, one of the things that we need to look at as well, and, and, and you, you brought this up, is not just uh, what, are the, what are the cryptocurrencies, but as it impacts our audience here, um, those financial institutions and and compliance personnel who deal with cryptocurrency, most often you'll be dealing with what we call VASPs. And VASP is a, a term that was coined by FATIP, which stands for Virtual Asset Service Provider. And basically that is any company whose, whose focus is, whose product focus is um, serving virtual assets. I'm gonna talk about six categories of those, uh, what they are and sort of what is the risk associated with them. So the first one you have is a fiat to crypto exchange. Uh, this is, these are or com companies like um, Gemini, Coinbase, uh, those sorts of, of institutions where you can go in with your dollars, euros, pounds, yen, yuan, pesos, your fiat currency, and you can purchase cryptocurrency. So if I want to go buy uh, a Bitcoin or a tenth of a Bitcoin or a ten thousandth of a Bitcoin, I can go do that with, with currency. Each of all of these institutions, uh, have banking uh, needs, of significant banking needs. A lot of them hold significant amounts of money. Uh, historically, they've banked in, in sort of developing country uh, banks uh, or banks in countries that are specifically very friendly to cryptocurrency. These are countries like uh, Switzerland, uh, Luxembourg, Malta, Gibraltar, um, the, U, uh, the, the uh, BVI, the British Virgin Islands, um, other other Caribbean nations as well. So we've seen a lot of developed countries, and as well as as countries that are just want to be on the forefront of this uh, of this revolution, opening up their banking sector to these uh, these types of businesses. Where in other countries, in, in Canada is a great example. It's very very difficult to be banked by a Canadian bank if you're one of these institutions. 
uh, when you're looking at this from a traditional uh, FI perspective, one of the things to look at with fiat to crypto exchanges is what cryptocurrency, uh, what cryptocurrencies do they work in, uh, and uh, what countries do they work in. Uh, in the same way that you would with with any business, you would want to understand their global footprint. The addition here is, do they work in in currencies like Monero, Zcash, or Dash, the the privacy coins? Do they work in very small uh, coins that are, don't have a lot of, of of information about them? They're sort of corner case coins, or are they working just with the the you know Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin? Uh, initially, uh, Coinbase for for many years were only worked in Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Litecoin. Um, and that made it a lot safer to do business with them uh, because of a concept called blockchain forensics, which we'll talk about in a moment. Then you have your crypto to crypto exchanges. Uh, these businesses don't deal with fiat currency at all. Their business is solely crypto to crypto. So if you want, if you have Bitcoin and you want Ether, if you have Litecoin and you want Dogecoin, that's what they, they are an exchange between cryptocurrencies. In general, these businesses don't hold or don't even need to hold much of any fiat. They will hold crypto their assets uh, in a, in a, um, as cryptocurrency, and often they'll hold that offsite in cold storage. What cold storage means is that uh, you take all of the, the security parameters, what we call the private keys, and you put those off. Sometimes it's literally on a sheet of paper. On, it can be on a flash drive. It can be on any sort of device. And you unplug that from any anything uh, connected to a computer, and so you may then go and put that that piece of paper or that flash drive in a safety deposit box or uh, in some other very secure vault, so that those keys can never be lost. Uh, but in these cases, they need banking for the function of the business, but not custodial for the holding of the funds. Uh, most of them uh, uh, self custody. Then we have what's called a decentralized exchange, and this is where things get very complicated. Uh, this concept just doesn't exist in, in the fiat space. A decentralized exchange is a meeting, is a virtual meeting place where individuals can come together and buy and sell currencies. So this would be almost like um, a trader floor, so the New York Stock Exchange trading floor, but a virtual version of that, where you would you would post something that says, you know, I have 10 Bitcoin, I want this much for them. And then someone else can say, okay, I will buy your 10 Bitcoin for the price you've asked. Uh, and then the trade would be facilitated outside, usually outside of that exchange. Decentralized exchanges pose very complex challenges from an AML and KYC perspective. While the, the fiat to crypto exchanges and crypto to crypto exchanges are clearly vast and therefore clearly need to, or uh, are required to have AML and KYC um, uh, policies, decentralized exchanges may or may not need to have those policies based on if they uh, facilitate the trade or not. And so this is where we start getting into the very specialized nature of regulation around cryptocurrency. Custodial services, these are, are services that will hold other people's cryptocurrency. So they will hold either the value or the keys themselves for someone else's cryptocurrency. Often this is in the case of businesses or institutions where it's a significant amount of cryptocurrency being held. And so these are services that need to be trusted not to make sure that the, the keys and the cryptocurrency themselves are hack proof. ICOs and STOs. ICO is an initial coin offering. STO is a, a security token offering. These are a way to purchase, whether it's with Bitcoin, Ethereum, any cryptocurrency, to be able to purchase assets, tokenized assets um, through the blockchain. And so we talked about this a few minutes ago with, with smart contracts and Ethereum, uh, but the, the, the way that this works is that you can, you can use uh, fiat currency to do this, but the big part of it is identifying if the asset being provided is a security or not. And this has been an area where regulators have been exceedingly on the ball. Uh, the SEC in the US and securities regulators around the world have been very, very focused on ensuring that where people are issuing token offerings, that the distinction between a security and a non-security is very clearly made. Um, so if you're buying a, a portion of a barrel of wine, that's very, very different than if you're buying stock in a, in a private company. 
And so that distinction and the, the regulations and exemptions around that are very critical, not just from an AML perspective, because AML and, and often enhanced due diligence must be covered uh, for investors. Uh, securities legislation comes into play in a significant way as well. Finally, there are a myriad of, of additional uh, services that, that are involved with cryptocurrency. There are wallet providers, ATM machines, uh, mixing services, um, services that, that you know, serve to predict value of cryptocurrency trading, um, all sorts of different um, service providers that fill out what is a complete financial landscape. Uh, the cryptocurrency industry has hundreds and, and hundreds of businesses to facilitate the transmission of, of these services. What, uh, a few that I think are worth mentioning, uh, one is a mixing service. A mixing service is, is a, a, a service designed to hide the originator or beneficiary of a transaction. And to put a little bit in, in context for this audience what a mixing service is, uh, one of the first ones was called bit laundry. So uh, it was specifically set up knowing that a mixing service is basically uh, a service that is designed to launder money, to hide and obfuscate the source and destination of funds. Uh, we also see Bitcoin ATMs. Uh, you may have seen them around in malls or airports. Uh, these are services where you put in your debit card um, and you can buy Bitcoin and they'll give you your, your private key or they'll put it in an online wallet for you. Uh, so the, the business landscape has really grown significantly over the last few years. Dan? Yeah, actually, it's amazing. Um, at a high level, given, given all you played out, and this still, through this, this still seems like a very nascent market. But um, even at this level, you know, the question always is, how much do we need to know about this? How much should we care about this? One of the ways we always phrase that, has anybody been held, held accountable to date. And we, let's just do that at a high level because we'll come back to that and, and talk about it in more detail. You know, there, there has been quite a bit. From a securities perspective, we've seen uh, globally a number of cease and desist orders um, come through. Uh, and so that's, that's from the security side. From the AML side, you know, the regulators, as they normally do, uh, we've seen some, some cease and desist. We've, ha we've seen businesses being shut down. Uh, but in general, the regulators are much more interested in businesses, especially new startup businesses, getting into compliance rather than being shut down. Uh, it's not the you know the, the regulators don't run around sort of uh, with a with a, a quota of how many businesses they want to shut down this month. Rather, their goal is to get people in compliance. And so the cases where we've seen uh, in, uh, enforcement action due to uh, AML and, and KYC deficiencies are for those institutions that have thumbed their nose at the regulator, that sort of believe they could get around it or were egregiously ignoring the regulator and regulator's advice. Um, you know, I, when I speak to, uh, to businesses within this space, uh, what, I, what I usually tell them is, you know, talk to the regulator, work with the regulator. They're not out there to get you, rather, they want to make sure you're under com in compliance because that moves the whole industry. And so, yes, we've seen uh, movement towards um, towards enforcement actions, and we've seen a number of enforcement actions. But those are usually for those egregious cases, and I think it's an important distinction to make. Yeah, it's interesting. And back back to Libra again, just to for a point of comparison here. The, it feels like. Um, First of all, they went to the regulators late. They put together a consortium of people who sort of agreed to agree. Um, no banks as 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 initial uh, organization signing on to, to back Libra. They they left the cart for much later in the process and finally went to regulators. But 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 in doing that, they also carried forward a good deal of baggage of concern about how they've conducted themselves through uh, privacy concerns and and especially in the EU, uh, frankly. But um, you know, so is the regulatory pushback or, or concerns over Libra really about their cryptocurrency or is it more about the conduct of the, of the company leading up to this? But I'll just, I'll just sort of leave that there. I don't know that there needs to be an answer to that. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, there, there's a lot of, of um, conversation and heated discussion within, within the cryptocurrency industry as to whether or not Libra is overall good or bad for cryptocurrency. Um, you know, and I think 
Facebook's attempt to sort of come at this way too late with regulators and, and a lot of the other ways that they've done it has painted them at least in, in sort of a negative light. Uh, the hope is that it doesn't paint the whole industry that way. So let's talk about some of the, the risks specific to cryptocurrency. Um, you know, the, the risks that exist for all of these businesses is the same as they are for AML, but there are special risks that are worth noting. The first is whether or not the, the, the business works uh, only in the crypto sphere. So is it crypto to crypto or do they work crypto to fiat? Are they in a, a gateway uh, into the traditional financial market? Um, there's different risks associated with that. A lot of the crypto to crypto vasts will work in uh, sort of less well-known cryptocurrencies. And so that can be an area of risk as well. A uh, centralized versus decentralized virtual asset. We talked about Libra being centralized. Uh, a number of the settlement networks are centralized as well. Uh, and so obviously any centralized network uh, does provide uh, oversight and governance um, by a centralized authority. Um, and so that both can add risk or can mitigate risk depending on who that central authority is. Anonymity or obfuscation of identity. We've talked about that a few times. Uh, and that can be done in a number of ways. One are these privacy coins. So that's Dash, uh, Monero, and Zchain. Um, but these, this can also be things like mixing services and uh, using uh, other services to hide the source or destination of funds. Uh, this is made for a very complex um, way of, of understanding transactions. Uh, we'll talk about um, blockchain forensics in a moment on how that can power better knowledge of, of the transaction history. Uh, the specific business model of the VAST. You know, what is the VAST trying to do? What is what is the business they're in? Um, obviously, like, like onboarding any company, uh, FIs need to have a good view as to who is their audience, who are the VASTs that they're, uh, that they're serving, and specifically, what is that VAST trying to do? So are they associated with selling goods? And if so, what goods? And where do those goods come from? And what is the, the foundational reason why the VASP is, is involved with cryptocurrency rather than with, uh, with traditional currency? Uh, the potential risk associated with VASP that are connected to several jurisdictions. Most players that run in, in virtual assets and cryptocurrency are not linked to a specific geography, especially those businesses that work in the crypto to crypto sphere. So if you work with fiat, then you may need, you may need registration uh, to take, to accept money. You may have to register as an MSB. Uh, when you work crypto to crypto, some businesses just sort of ignore those things uh, or maybe in a jurisdiction where that it doesn't matter, but uh, it's critical to understand the scope of where this VASP does business and is the VASP allowing or onboarding clients or enabling clients in sanctioned jurisdictions or with sanctioned individuals or entities. Uh, and that becomes a great risk of, you know, one of the power of cryptocurrency is it liberates people uh, to be able to move money more freely and less expensively. One of the risks is that it does make criminal activity and the activity of sanctioned individuals and nations uh, a lot easier. And then what is the, the nature and the scope of, of the account, the product or the service? What is the business trying to do? Where are they doing it? And what is the purpose of what they're doing? Uh, and finally, the security of the virtual asset. Uh, and this is an area where, where if you're dealing directly with a, uh, an institution that works in, uh, that is building a cryptocurrency, uh, you wanna make sure that, that they have the security in place, that the money is, is safe, any money that's loaned to them, any money that you're holding um, in custody for them uh, is with a company that is not at, at huge risk of, uh, of security breaches. Uh, we've seen a number of these breaches in the past and we want to sort of as an industry make sure that those are uh, are, are as rare as possible well those are the the risks that are specific to cryptocurrency uh, let's take sort of a, a huge step jump back and look at what are the risks what are the general aml risks and i don't think anyone put it sort of as succinctly as well as as uh, sec chairman jay clayton uh, and what, what he said and this was a couple of years ago now but replacing a traditional corporate interest recorded in a central ledger with an enterprise interest recorded through a blockchain entry on a distributed ledger may change the form of the transaction, but it does not change the substance. And what's critical about that is the last, the last line. 
that it's not the form that a transaction or a business takes, but what is the function? Is the function of the business to move money, to exchange value, to uh, hold money as a custodial service? What is the purpose, the fundamental purpose of the business, ignoring for a moment whether or not it works with through cryptocurrency? And that becomes a hugely important area for uh, businesses in, crypt in the crypto space, as well as FIs working with them. Uh, in a way, you need to take a, take away all of the crypto, the uh, you know uh, distributed ledger, blockchain, sort of erase all of that. Look underneath the hood and say, well, what is fundamentally, what is this business trying to do? And from a regulator perspective, that's what they're doing. And from a business perspective, that's a key part of understanding the risk. You know, the regulators have said, if you're trans if you're uh, exchanging uh, cryptocurrencies, you are an MSP. Uh, you must register as an MSP. Uh, if you're selling tokenized assets, uh, security assets, you must register uh, as a as a security uh, broker dealer. Uh, or you may have to get an exemption to broker dealer and SEC or other securities regulators. And so understanding, ignoring the form, looking at the function is a critical way for crypto businesses and those FIs working with crypto businesses to understand what are your requirements? Because it's not the, it's not the for, form, it's the function. The function is what matters. Now the form may add additional compliance on top of it, but the function is really where we need to be focusing our attention. Uh, I think it's worth um, now just really focusing on on an example, and we'll use uh, we'll use FinCEN uh, as an example of this because I think they're um, they produce some some very good white papers and guidance on cryptocurrency. Now, while I'm using FinCEN as an example, uh, you know we can we can look at at the form versus function really as a guiding principle globally. Now there are jurisdictions where banking may be um, um, restricted. There are jurisdictions where cryptocurrency has been outlawed completely. Uh, there are jurisdictions where it's completely free and open. Uh, and so understanding jurisdictional risk as it relates to cryptocurrency is, is a key part of doing business in this space. In the same way that understanding different areas of corruption risk or uh, AML risk or uh, other geopolitical risks has been key to doing business globally for decades. So I'm not going to go through sort of at a at a very detailed view all of the things that that FinCEN has said as it relates to crypto businesses, but very briefly, um, the general guidance is if the business is is facilitating a transaction, they must be registered and and have a complete AML program, file SARS and CTRs um, complete their full AML requirements, have a, a chief AML officer or, or a chief compliance officer. All of those requirements um, uh, are required if, if, the, if the primary source or significant portion of the business is facilitating the movement of, of currency, regardless if that currency is cryptocurrency or, or traditional fiat currency. Uh, FATF has said the same thing. Uh, FATF has come out and said, that jurisdictions must require registration of MSBs in cryptocurrency um, where they where they allow cryptocurrency to be. FATF has said that it's up to each jurisdiction to determine whether or not cryptocurrency is legal and the level of legality there. Um, but they have said that any AML requirements that are applied to traditional fiat currency apply to cryptocurrency as well. Um, We've, we've seen some other sort of interesting rulings. Uh, the EU, for example, while cryptocurrency is legal, uh, Estonia tried to release its own cryptocurrency sort of as a supplement to a, to a national currency and the EU said, no, that's not allowed. Uh, so each jurisdiction is taking a very specific look at these things. Um, one of the key things is, the la is, is sort of the last two points. One is if you're a software, uh, software developer and you're developing dApps, for Ethereum or other smart contracts, most likely you do not need to comply with the BSA. You're a software provider. Uh, unless if you're operating the DAP or you own the DAP, that's separate than if you're just the designer. In the same way that a software company that writes software for ATM machines doesn't have to comply with 
with uh, AML requirements, the operator of the ATM machine does. Privacy coins, Zcash, Monero, and, and the other ones, and mixing services and tumblers must comply with AML requirements. And this is an incredibly difficult thing for them to do. And so we've seen a lot of, uh, of, of questions as to, is that even possible? And what does that mean for the future of these, in, these privacy coins? Um, and then, you know, there, there's a list of types of businesses and types of VASPs is, is huge. We talked about DEXs a little bit. Um, you know, there's mining pools, which are another way to, to earn cryptocurrency. Uh, and a lot of this, all of this depends uh, as to who facilitates the movement of funds. And so again, really what we're looking at is, is one of the difficulties I think a lot of financial institutions have had is that all of the cryptocurrency lingo uh, gets very confusing when really what you wanna focus on is what is, the, what is the function of the business? What are they trying to do at a fundamental level? You know, there, there's a lot of risks uh, associated with, with cryptocurrency that uh, we, we talked about these and I, you know, while I may sound a little bit like a, um, a repetitive, I think some of these concepts are, have been missed by so many people who are, have been afraid of cryptocurrency, you know? So I'll, I'll say, I'll say it one more time. Traditional AML still applies. Um, if you're, you know, any business that's, that's involved in the transmission of cryptocurrency must deal with traditional AML. Um, any, you know, if you're built, if you're operating ATM machines for cryptocurrency, uh, those, they, those have different obligations than, uh, traditional AM, uh, ATM machines, because just because they're called ATM machines, it's not exactly what they are. Um, uh, so you look at what is the function of that machine, uh, payment processors and all those sorts of businesses all still have to comply with AML. One of the things that's been interesting about this is that a lot of the new businesses that are have entered the space have made AML and KYC responsibilities much more public. And so people are becoming much more familiar with this concept of AML and KYC, whereas traditionally it was handed, it was handled in a back office and no one was really aware of what's going on. And so a lot of these crypto businesses are struggling with how to how to deal with AML and KYC. And that's a lot of what uh, what Alessa and I comply why we're working together to help solve some of those issues. Uh, using blockchain forensics. Uh, blockchain forensics is a key piece of understanding the risk associated with individuals and entities transacting on the blockchain. What blockchain forensics does is it looks at the history of transactions. One of the things about, about Bitcoin, Ethereum, most of the cryptocurrencies is that the ledger is public. You can see all of the transactions. What you can't see is who owns the addresses. But blockchain forensics firms um, have done the research to identify many of the, of the owners of different wallet addresses. And there, therefore you can go and map out the history of transactions. So is, your, is the individual who is coming into your institution and who shared their, uh, their address with you, um, is, has that person been involved with any mixing services? Have they transacted directly or indirectly with money launderers, terrorist finance groups, dark websites, those sorts of things. And these blockchain forensics firms, um, and, and of which I comply, uh, facilitates uh, those tools as well. Uh, but these blockchain forensics firms are, uh, can produce very easy to understand risk scores, as well as allowing you to really dive deeply into understanding the entire uh, risk view of an individual. And so you can do both a high level due diligence as well as an enhanced due diligence on a blockchain address. The other things you wanna look for, and this is a lot of what we spoke about before of identifying what is the purpose of the business or the purpose of the transactions that you've been able to identify. Um, one, you know, has the individual or entity uh, transacted with any dark websites or if you're onboarding a company, are they involved with any dark websites? Uh, are, are they involved with, with Tor? Are they involved with uh, any sites like Silk Road? Um, because those can obviously be, uh, and, and, and in many cases are used for, the, for funding illicit activities. You wanna make sure that the companies you're doing business with are who they say they are. Punicode URLs is a, is a new thing that's sort of come out over the last couple of years. And what this does is it allows people to register a URL that looks very similar to another, another word but they've changed characters to make it really hard to tell it's different. 
And so making sure you understand who you're dealing, doing business with, making sure that they are the people who they represent. Uh, avoiding things like cryptocurrency giveaways. Nobody's giving away cryptocurrency for free. Uh, pump and dump schemes. Uh, so being able to, to look at the individuals and entities who, are, who you're doing business with and see if there's suspicious trading activity that may hint at a pump and dump. And finally, we've talked about this before, uh, the, the use of mixing services becomes a critical piece of, uh, of identifying suspicious uh, risky activity. Now, there are a lot of people who use cryptocurrency because anonymity and privacy is very important to them. It doesn't mean that they're doing anything criminal or, uh, or nefarious, but as all of us know, being in, in compliance uh, with, with anonymity and privacy comes potential risk and definitely come, requires additional scrutiny. And so every institution needs to make a decision as to how they wanna do business with those, those individuals that really pride themselves on, on that, the privacy view. So a few key takeaways, uh, and then we'll, we'll sort of open this up to questions. Um, so while, while regulations are evolving, and, and truly these change every day, if not every week, um, extra attention needs to be paid on on what regulators require for compliance. For those offering, operating in the UN, um, FinCEN has issued guidance. For those operating in other countries, you, you must you know, consult the, your local regulator, as well as consulting um, legal experts in cryptocurrency. There has been a, a renaissance of, of these legal experts that know uh, very, very detailed information about, um, about specifically about cryptocurrency regulation in specific jurisdictions. Risk profile each cryptocurrency. If you want to do business with a, with a VASP or if you want to open up your business to a VASP, identify what cryptocurrencies you feel, you feel are, are, have an understandable risk. Not every cryptocurrency is built the same and each one poses unique risk. Uh, you can think of this in the same way that you think of risk ranking countries. Um, you, you know, each of you either pulls that data from a third party or you have an internal desk that manages uh, geopolitical risk. Same thing needs to happen for, for cryptocurrencies, for understanding both which cryptocurrencies you're willing to work with, as well as what types of VASPs you're willing to work with. In addition to tra traditional transaction monitoring, you must monitor the transactions in the blockchain. Traditional transaction monitoring really only serves uh, the fiat transaction monitoring space. Um, you must engage with, uh, with blockchain forensics firms and other third parties that can ensure the security of the transactions on the blockchain. Make sure that any businesses you work with meet standards for KYC and AML. Ask for their documentation, ask for their, um, you know, to speak to their chief compliance officer or their CAMLO. And finally, uh, uh, rely, look for um, additional risks that are unique to cryptocurrency, all those risks that we spoke about already. Um, and then uh, rely on technology. Uh, there are a lot of, of new firms. Uh, iComply is, is one of them. Uh, there are a lot of new firms that are answering a lot of different questions as on how you, you de-risk cryptocurrency. One of the big things to remember, and I'll, I'll sort of end on this note, uh, one of the big things to remember is that cryptocurrency is not going anywhere. This is an industry that is here to stay, that institutions are going to continue to, um, to grow, people, more people, money is going to get spent on with cryptocurrency, more businesses are going to accept it. And so um, traditional financial institutions and traditional businesses need to find a way to work within this industry and understand it rather than sort of just ignore it. Uh, I think it, it opens up a lot of potential opportunity for those financial institutions that are willing to put forth the effort. Um, there's a lot of business that's available there for those that are willing to do that. Uh, so with that, uh, I will turn this uh, back over to Anu to yes. give a little bit of a, of a background on our, on our sponsors. Yes, Greg, that was excellent. Thank you very much. So uh, we actually received a fair number of questions, but before we get to the questions, um, I'd, I'd like to spend just a minute to talk about Alessa and iComply. So Alessa is an end-to-end -end AML compliance platform with due diligence, sanctions, um, and watch list screening, transaction monitoring, automated regulatory reporting, and all the management tools that you need, including dashboards, workflow, and case management. 
And we work with banks, MSBs, casinos, and fintechs to help them ensure full compliance with AML regulations. Now, when we need specialized functionality, like when working with cryptos, we integrate with industry experts like iComply. And iComply offers a number of services, including digital onboarding, uh, identity uh, document verification, uh, source of wealth, proof of address, blockchain forensics, and of course, wallet ownership verification. So I hope from this presentation, you were able to see that the team at Alessa and iComply really understand AML compliance and encourage you, and I encourage you to reach out to us with any questions you may have. So with that, uh, I'd like to turn to our first question. Um, and, and Greg, when, when the first question I had is, what is a key? What is the key? What exactly is a key? Oh, sorry, a key. I thought you meant a key. key. Like, what, yes. is key? What, what exactly um, is it? So the way that, that cryptocurrency works is that you've, you've got two pieces of identifying data. One is called a public key and one is a private key. Uh, a public key is just like it says on the tin. It is public. You can share with anybody. Uh, it is a long string of, of letters and numbers uh, that you can say um, it's giving out your public key is sort of like giving out your email address for Venmo or PayPal. So someone could then send you money. You could send them money. Um, it's something that could easily be shared um, as an identifier for you, but nobody could, can steal your money with it. Your private key is basically like your password. It is also a very long sequence of letters and numbers. Uh, it's not something you can choose, but what your private key enables is the thing that allows you to, to transact. So your private key is the security that locks your wallet down to just you being able to use it. So while your public key, you can put it on your business card, on your email signature, you can skywrite your, your public key, your private key should never ever be shared. Giving your private key away is sort of like giving someone your bank access to your bank account. With your private key, they can take all of your money. And one of the big things to remember with cryptocurrency versus fiat, and this is one of the, the big risks for, for new users, is Unlike traditional currency, if, you, if your credit card gets stolen and someone goes and buys something with your credit card, you can get that money back. With cryptocurrency, if the money is stolen, it's gone forever. Uh, and that's true as well. If you lose your private key, that money is gone forever. And so that's one thing that people have to be very, very, very careful of. It's also a place that a lot of uh, VASPs have that's opened up to make that easier for people. So the next question is, uh, what additional factors does a, a financial institution need to assess before being able to bank a VASP? You know, the first thing I would do is speak to your uh, your regulator uh, and understand. Uh, I would uh, understand what are your the requirements specific to uh, within your jurisdiction for onboarding a VASP, and not just your uh, if if you're if you're in the U.S. This may be your state regulator as well. New York State, for example, uh, has the Bit License Program, which make, which puts an extra step uh, to opening a VAS. So you want to make sure they have their Bit License in place. If you're in other countries, you may just need to speak to your national regulator to understand the legal framework. Uh, I would I would bring in I would consult with a cryptocurrency lawyer as well to understand uh, other banking issues within your jurisdiction. And then I would you know like any new business I would put a toe in the water. Uh, don't go and I wouldn't onboard, you know, billions of dollars worth of assets on day one, but put a toe in the water and, and uh, start building out your compliance program for cryptocurrency as you did for traditional currency. Uh, there are going to be some additional requirements uh, and there's going to be some additional learning that your analysts are going to have to do when understanding cryptocurrency. Now, can you speak to the new regulations from FATF uh, related to the travel rule with crypto exchanges? Sure. So I'll, I'll, I'll interrupt that first by saying that FATF doesn't release regulations. Uh, so FATF releases guidance. Okay. Uh, the big difference there in, is that regulation has enforcement and FATF really has no, has no real enforcement ability. That's true. What the, the travel rule is, uh, and, and you, many of you may be familiar with this, but basically what the travel rule says for general, for fiat currency, is that the originator and beneficiary of any transaction must be identified and screened, both by the origination, originating institution 
the destination institution, and any correspondent banks as well. And so it puts a significant onus on ensuring that at every step of the way, as that money travels globally, uh, it's screened um, by, by all of the necessary institutions. Where this has come uh, into some very big challenges for cryptocurrency is that cryptocurrency transactions, first of all, don't have to happen through, a, through an exchange. I can send someone cryptocurrency directly from my, you know, my cell phone, my computer, without needing to go through a third party exchange. Um, if I do go through an exchange, the exchange probably doesn't have um, any information on who the destination is beyond their cryptocurrency address. And so this has posed significant challenges for the crypto industry as to how in the world this could be solved. The other issue, and, and so one of the issues there is, well, if you're sending money from point A to point B, you could include in the transaction, as, they, as SWIFT does, information on the destination. The problem is that, that these cryptocurrency uh, networks aren't built to hold that data, and a lot of people in the cryptocurrency space aren't interested in that data being held. And so there are a lot of people investigating uh, other alternatives, off-chain alternatives. One of the additional challenges is that what FATF has said is that not only does the information on origination and beneficiary need to be shared, it needs to be shared in, uh, instantaneously with the transaction. And so this has posed significant challenges for, um, for crypto institutions. And, and really, as an industry, no one's really sure how this is going to be solvable. Uh, it's, it's definitely an interesting challenge going forward. So the uh, next question is, uh, are you aware of any major dark web bazaars since Silk Road and Hansa got shut down? And so do regulators have a plan to monitor or, or detect transactions used for illicit activity? Um, so I will say that uh, I personally uh, don't spend a lot of time uh, in that arena. Um, there are, however, companies these days that do, there are a number of these, of these, um, of these dark websites and there have been a few compliance type companies that are doing um, data scraping of dark websites to look for things like cryptocurrency addresses, to look at specific products being sold to help mitigate this. Uh, this is something uh, obviously law enforcement is very keen to, um, to mitigate and to shut down. But in a lot of cases, this is like playing whack-a-mole. You shut down one, uh, one dark website and the next one pops up. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's not worth doing. Uh, because the more you shut them down, the more they sort of get spread out and distributed into a lot of smaller um, sites, which which then make the transactions more difficult. It uh, makes it harder for people to find what they're looking for. Uh, so there are an, a, still a number of sites in operation. This is a constant focus of law enforcement. One of the things that that these that these um, dark websites use is something called Tor, um, which stands for the Onion Router, and Tor is a a privacy protocol to make it very difficult to determine um, where someone is, their IP address, those sorts of things. So uh, it really is a, 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 a cat and mouse of identifying who these perpetrators are, where they live, and then bringing them to justice. Okay, so and I think that that's a good follow up to our next question. So by flagging certain wallets, law enforcement could potentially contact financial institutions for account activity records, similar to 314A. So if so, do you believe that something like that would lower the inherent risk of cryptocurrency as a whole? I, I think that would, you know, we, we've sort of started to see that a little bit with OFAC now, including Bitcoin addresses in, uh, in a couple of OFAC sanctioned profiles. Uh, so OFAC, over a year ago, OFAC announced that they would start including cryptocurrency addresses. And then earlier in this year, they added the first, I believe they've added, a, oh, sorry, they added their first two. So we're starting to see that at the sanction level. Uh, I think adding this like a 314 list would be incredibly valuable. Um, I know there are a lot of uh, a lot of players in this market uh, who are you know blockchain forensics firms and other institutions like that who work very very closely with law enforcement to facilitate that sort of information tra trading and information gathering. And I know that law enforcement does work very closely with at the edge points um, at the exchanges where currency where people are pulling out um, fiat currency. And so law enforcement is very much engaged in this. Uh, I think we're only going to see that grow. Uh, and I, I think what you said, what the, the questioner asked of, of this being like a 314 request, I think is is definitely the way that things are probably going to go. Okay. Definitely, probably. Yeah, so, 
definitely probably more likely. <laughs> And, and so I, I think the, the follow-up questions is also related. Um, and for, I'd like to thank all of the people who are submitting questions. The questions are still coming. And those who are staying with us and listening to the answers, there's certainly lots of good conversation here. So are there in the crypto world any compliance regulations similar or, co or equivalent to the 10,000 24-hour used for fiat? So the $10,000 rule uh, still exists for crypto. It's the it's it is still in dollars. It's not in. Uh, I don't know of any regulator that has put that in place as a a crypto amount. Basically, what they've said is if the value is equivalent to that to the ten thousand uh, dollar limit, then that um, that goes through. I'm not aware of any regulations around the twenty four hour rule, um, okay. but I so I, I haven't heard of anyone pushing that. Okay. Um, the next but, question but, is. But, sorry, I should answer. Go ahead. Question. For the ten thousand dollar rule, if it's even if it's cryptocurrency, a CTR still has to be filed. Okay. So if it's one bitcoin, one bitcoin's worth around ten thousand dollars, a CTR still has to be filed. Okay, so as the five AMLD extends AML and CDD requirements, particularly ensuring the client has filed uh, beneficial ownership details, this should combat the secrecy, the secrecy and anonymity. Do you feel these MSBs are ready to properly verify this info? Given the lack of BSA, AML, and KYC education with many of them, regulations playing catch up, how can we rely on the data being accurate for beneficial ownership? You know, I think there, there's a lot There's a lot to unpack there. Uh, I'll sort of answer what I think are yes. the two big questions. Uh, one is, do these new MSBs know what they're doing? No, most of them don't. And to be completely honest, that's why I comply um, exists in a lot of ways is to help these MSBs um, start doing their compliance in a way that they can uh, they can do it in a very simple plug and play sort of way. Um, there, you know, compliance on the low end for for you know some MSBs, you can sort of get onboarded. What what I complies business is is helping those clients do their CIP program, AML, KYC all of that in a very easy way because many of these institutions simply don't know what they're doing. Uh, you know, they may have their their, C, their chief compliance officer may just be their general counsel who doesn't really know much about AML. Uh, and so that's something that I comply is, is helping business with uh, globally um, uh, with, that, with that problem. The other part of your question was, um, is, is the UBO data that's available good enough? I don't think anybody can, would tell you that yes, it is. Um, the reality is that there are too few companies that source that data, um, and that data is too difficult to get in a lot of jurisdictions. So, due to privacy rules, or you know, due to just the nature of certain jurisdictions, uh, that information can be difficult or impossible to get. And there just simply aren't enough companies sourcing that data globally, where you have good backup of what's what's going on. Yeah. Um, who the companies are, we're relying on too few players for it. I think UBO is a big, it's, I think it's one of the biggest, if not the biggest challenge facing AML and KYC today. It certainly is. Um, so when verifying source of funds for a cryptocurrency transaction, have I done an adequate level of due diligence if I verify the source of the blockchain only? Meaning, should, should I, as the AML analyst, push customers to provide details of how they obtained it in the first place? Would regulators be satisfied with just the blockchain forensics? It's a good question. You know, it is. It's a great question. Uh, I, I would. I would hate to speak on behalf of a regulator. I think that would only get all of us in trouble. Yes. Um, you know, every regulator is different, and every business is different. And so, the amount of due diligence that you need to do is not going to necessarily be the same as the amount of due diligence that um, that a company, a, a small or a large institution, would do. Um, what we need is better information sharing across institutions uh, and better uh, better uh, confidence that institutions that are the you know if someone if someone got their cryptocurrency by purchasing it through an exchange and that was the original source, we need to be able to know that those exchanges have met their KYC requirements. Um, but through blockchain forensics, I think you're getting a lot of the way to where you need to be. And okay. I think that, that that is most likely in today's world going to be sufficient. Okay. 
and everybody should obviously consult with legal uh, right, when deciding. Right. Don't, don't trust the webinar for legal advice. That's right. Um, do you believe the crypto to crypto will be regulated? It already is. Already is. So crypto to crypto exchanges um, are have to register as MSBs um, in, in most jurisdictions, if not all. FADIP has said that crypto to crypto is an MSB. Um, so yes, they are. Is there any current sanction list in any jurisdiction for people who have been known to deal with crypto for criminal purposes? The only sanction list that involves crypto right now is OFAC lists two Iranians um, uh, as, as sanctioned individuals and with their Bitcoin addresses. There is no blockchain specific sanction list. So Greg, this might be a good place if, if there's more details on instances or where somebody's been uh, held accountable for going sideways with a regulator. Uh, sure, yeah. I think, you know, uh, as I mentioned before, you know, there's a lot of, we see a lot of, of you know, regulators saying, come on guys, let's, let's get it together. Uh, but we've also seen some, some enforcements. I think an interesting one was from a few months ago, uh, a guy named Eric Powers. Uh, was fined $35,000 uh, for buying and selling Bitcoin as a business without registering as an MSB. Uh, an unusual uh, thing for, for FinCEN in that it was an enforcement against an individual um, because he was acting as a business. Uh, we've seen fines from FinCEN as high of BTCE, which was uh, an exchange, uh, was fined $110 million uh, by FinCEN a couple of years ago. Um, We've seen um, uh, cease and desists and return of returns of return of funds required by the SEC and exchange regulators globally. Uh, in Australia, uh, we've seen exchanges shut down due to ties to illicit activities and illicit mm -hmm. drugs. Uh, and then in Canada, we've seen civil forfeitures as well. So uh, the number of examples is uh, is definitely you know increasing over time, um, but I. I think the regulators really are focused on compliance rather than enforcement, yeah. uh, which, which is which is good. That's what we want to be seeing. The goal is not to to penalize everyone. The goal rather is to get this industry to move towards compliance. And, and coming back to the the sanctions list, I, I think uh, obviously third party lists. Uh, are, are offer a richness of information and um, every financial institution should have the conversation with their partners like Refinitiv to see what kind of information they have available because it's, it's always uh, increasing and changing. That's right and some of the blockchain forensics firms as well will have lists um, of their high-risk um, or terrorist related uh, addresses um, so you know this expands your your you know list acquisition um, problem a little bit, um, but it does open up an entirely new world of business. So, like like any business, any new business opportunity, uh, there's risk associated with this, and you just need to understand and mitigate that risk. Correct. Yeah. So we're almost at the end of the questions here. So, what are the crypto-friendly countries today, and why do you think they're based on and on what on what factors? Um, so there's a number of, of you know crypto-friendly. I think is a is a, a very uh, broad term. Um, I, you know, when we look at those countries that have, have been sort of the most open to crypto, uh, Switzerland is, is sort of, you know, crypto heaven. Lots and lots of businesses opening up in Switzerland and a lot of very, very open to, uh, to crypto business. Uh, Canada has been very open to uh, crypto from a VAST perspective. There are a lot of VAST and other crypto businesses that are opening up in Canada. Um, Vancouver has, has sort of become a crypto hub, although Canada has sort of a mixed view because banking is still quite difficult with Canadian banks. Uh, then you have um, uh, jurisdictions like Malta, Gibraltar, Cyprus. Um, they have been very, very open to, um, to cryptocurrency investment. Um, their banks are much more open to cryptocurrency. And so we've seen a, a huge uh, amount of business being brought to those those areas uh, as well. Uh, Latin America is very diverse in its look, its view of crypto. Uh, Venezuela has its own cryptocurrency, uh, whereas Argentina has sort of been a little more uh, uh, hands off. Okay. Um, and so, you know, jurisdictionally it's different. In the Middle East, I think is another great example where 
um, especially in those countries that are, are uh, theocracies, uh, we've seen sort of a, a movement of how they view cryptocurrency as it relates to um, both uh, Sharia law and as it relates to their local policies. Okay. Um, so it, it's constantly changing. It's really, it's one of the most interesting areas to, to research is, is what's going on um, jurisdictionally. So, so the next question I think is it relates to that the previous list uh, question on sanctions and are there resources listings uh, are there resources listing wallets public keys that have been involved in criminal or suspicious activities? So there are a few sites that that list this publicly. Um, there's EtherScam is one. Um, e oh, sorry, EtherScamDB.info. Uh, they have a, a database of of scam Ethereum. Um, there's also one that's more broad called Crypto Scam DB. Uh, that's sort of more general scams um, that people basically people post their um, if, if they find a scam website or a scam crypto address, people will post it. Um, you know the the problem with those sort of public domain lists is that it always becomes you know who is verifying that data and um, you know is this being done like anyone can submit and then is it being verified and how does that verification work um, my recommendation would be to, to go through uh, a blockchain forensics firm um, that can that can either provide a list to you directly or um, or you can search through as you get transactions and that's something that i can like can do as well is provide you with uh, tools to search against blockchain forensics. We're way past our allotted time. Uh, so for everyone who, who did stay with us, thank you very much. If you have any questions, feel free to email us. You can reach us at alessa at caseware.com. And this now concludes our presentation. And I hope you have a great day.